Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. We're here for an hour of uno primero goodness. I don't know what I'm talking about. It's going to be a really <laughs> great show. That's what I mean. You're excited. I'm super excited. As Mark Dunn used to say, I'm higher than a prom dress in June. Nice. I'm jacked up yeah. higher than a California <laughs> condor on ecstasy. <laughs> This is going to be fun more than fun a June than bug a June on a bug string. On a string. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway. Oh, uh, so, yeah, let's just roll the music so we can get to the content and uh, better know framework time. Yeah. Awesome. All right, man. What do you got? This is an article from the New York Times, and mm. I guess it's redone through an msn.com link that's where i heard it but it's a story that came out in may and it's alexa and siri can hear this hidden command you can't so get this many people have grown accustomed to talking to their smart devices asking them to read a text play a song or set an alarm but someone else might be secretly talking to them too over the past two years researchers in china and the united states have begun demonstrating that they can send hidden commands that are undetectable to the human ear to Apple's Siri, Amazon's Alexa, and the Google Assistant. Interesting. Inside university labs, the researchers have been able to secretly activate the artificial intelligence systems on smartphones and smart speakers, making them dial phone numbers or open websites. In the wrong hands, the technology could be used to unlock doors, wire money, or buy stuff online, Simply with music playing over the radio. Ouch. What could go wrong? What could go wrong? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I hate to put a tinfoil hat on, but this is possible, right? Sure. But many things are possible. You're just going to have to put gates on, you know, transactions. When do you actually pull the trigger on a transaction? Yeah, and exactly. And ultimately, who's liable for that transaction? Right. And, uh, you know, usually these transactions don't just go through without some sort of user intervention, right? I mean, sure. generally, you, you have to click a button somewhere. Yep. You know, and if you can't, and if you don't have to, you probably should have human interaction required for any of these well, and important and Plus things. just liability. You know, nice thing about credit cards is that unless somebody can produce a signed slip from you, you can decline it. Right, And even if they do, if they didn't deliver the goods you expected, you can protest it. Like Some things have consumer protections. Just be aware of what it is. Yep. That's right. I guess that's what we're saying here. So who's yep. talking to us, Richard? Uh, grabbed a comment off a of show 1537, which we recorded only back in April of 2018 with Laurent Bignon talking about Xamarin. You know, we're going to do a little XAML cross-platform conversation. I thought it would only be appropriate yep. to... Uh, to dig into some of that stuff. And this uh, particular comment comes from Daywid, okay. who said, uh, Carl and Richard, am I correct in thinking that for cross-platform development from the IDE point of view, it becomes easier with Apple abandoning the power PC architecture in favor of Intel chips? And with hmm. Apple planning to use its own chips and Macs going forward in 2020, replacing Intel, does that mean a step back for cross-platform Mac and Win developers? Now, I think it's important. This is a great question. Yeah. It's important to realize, I mean, Mac, Mac went away from PowerPC a long time ago, right? That, sure. that was what, more, more than 10 years ago. And uh, because Intel had accelerated so far down the performance line that the PowerPC Motorola couldn't keep up with uh, with those kinds of, of performance. They just to get a high-performance machine, they were pretty much stuck with Intel. What Apple has recently announced is they're going to start using their custom versions of ARM chips, the ones they use in their iPhones and their iPads, in PC-like infrastructure, in hmm. Mac-like machines, hmm. uh, which is very interesting to me because it does mean essentially abandoning everything in the traditional Mac architecture. Right. Like the the all that software is just not going to run. They're going to have iPhone and and iPad software. They're not going to have the other software. Now, that it's one way to leave behind the baggage, right? That now everything's going to have to go through the store. The old software is simply not going to run. Uh, is it going to impact our ability to do cross-platform development? Not really, because we're already doing cross-platform onto ARM. So 
those abstractions exist. It'll take some time for the developers to tweak and tune the essential issues. Certainly the UI pieces are going to be interesting, but I would expect support for it to come fairly quickly given adoption of the devices. Right. What if Apple does this and nobody buys it because I really wanted a Mac and it doesn't run Mac software? Right. It's like I already had a big iPhone. I call it an iPad. Now you made me a bigger iPhone? <laughs> So uh, it, it it absolutely is doable. I don't think it's necessarily an impediment. The question is whether or not it'll be relevant, and we're just going to have to watch and see. It's going to happen in the next couple of years. Yep. I agree, Richard. Yeah. Dawid, thank you so much for your comment. A copy of Music to Code By is on its way to you. And if you'd like a copy of Music to Code By, write a comment on the website at .netrocks.com or via any of our social media, because we publish every show to Google Plus and Facebook. And if you comment there and we read it on the show, we'll send you a copy of Music to Code By. And definitely follow us on Twitter. He's at Rich Campbell. I'm at Carl Franklin. Send us a tweet, and you'll be numero uno in our book. Oh, that's sweet. That ni- Isn't that nice? Okay, Isn't let's nice? bring on our rock stars today. Francois Tanguay and Jérôme Laban are a couple of guys that are working on this UNO project, and let me tell you all about them. Francois is the CEO and founder of Inventive, a digital experience agency founded in 2008 with a family of over 120 passionate individuals. Before founding Inventive, Francois was helping large banks and insurance companies manage change toward more agile processes. Prior to that, he participated in the software architecture of the Enterprise Library Framework and Unity Container for the Patterns and Practices team at Microsoft. Jérôme Laval has been programming since 1998, mainly involved in .NET and C-sharp development as teacher, trainer, consultant in France, and is currently a software architect at Inventive, building mobile apps in Montreal, Canada. He's been working for the past few years on building the Uno platform to improve the development cycle of cross-platform apps using Windows, iOS, Android, and WebAssembly using Mono and Xamarin. Welcome, guys. Welcome, Francois. Hello, German. Thanks for having us. Welcome, Jerome. And uh, just so we can identify your voices, I think Francois was the first one who spoke there. Yes? I was, sir. Okay. And Jerome. Yes. Uh, you guys, uh, we got hooked up at Build, and somebody said, you got to you gotta go talk to the .NET Rocks guys. And we said, yeah, just come on over and talk to us. And uh, once, once you told us what this was all about, our head exploded, and we had to have you on the show. What is Uno? Uh, that's a good question. So, you know, we look at it as a UWP bridge or a Windows, a universal Windows platform bridge uh, to target uh, iOS, Android, and actually WebAssembly now as a technology preview. So we, we really look at it as a UWP everywhere kind of recipe where you build it once with a promise that it'll run everywhere. Now, so this is a, an, an experience that's very similar to Xamarin Forms. In other words, you have a template that you download and then when you build a new Uno app, you get the multiple projects, and just like you do with the Xamarin Forms app, a UWP project, an iOS project, an Android project. The difference is, right, in the, in the stack that you use for XAML, you're actually, you guys actually rewrote the, the XAML stack of UWP for all three of these platforms. Is that right? It is, and the way we approached that, uh, we took a different road than what uh, Xamarin Forms did. So instead of trying to uh, invent a new XAML language or a new flavor of XAML, we looked at what Microsoft had did with the uh, had done with the UWP XAML, and we were we were like, this is nice, this is neat. The dev loop is amazing. If you're looking at the experience that a developer has today on a Visual Studio uh, tool set with uh, all the goodies of XAML and it and continue, C Sharp and it and continue. We really looked at it and figured out, like, if we were able to create a bridge and just re- keep this as our primary uh, dev loop experience, we'd probably get away with a better uh, dev experience, right? So because it's faster to compile, build, and deploy on a UWP stack on your Windows machine and Windows box, we figured out why not just create a bridge, and that's what's been happening over the years. That's no small feat. I mean, UWP is is big. And I mean, just like Xamarin Forms was no small feat, but uh, the immediate things that come to mind are there's so many things in UWP that are Windows specific. And, you know, I'm thinking of the, you know, the hardware services and the other services that, that the platform provides. 
So you had to sort of map those across, right? Was that the biggest challenge? Yes. So the biggest challenge was probably managing priorities as to what to tackle first. And if you're looking at it from a different angle, uh, we've been building this in the context of our software agency, right? So we're building mobile apps for a variety of our customers. So that really drove what features would be working on first and foremost. And still today, we're not promising to have 100% code coverage, but uh, of what UWP offers, because it is massive. Uh, we're reaching out, and that's probably the primary reason why we're open sourcing it today is uh, as a reach out to the community to help provide whatever gaps are left and uh, implement those gaps, right? But we, as we've developed hundreds of mobile apps on top of it, we figured out that we'd have enough coverage that we could put it out in the community and that you should be facing similar challenges that we've been facing across all the apps that we've developed and that we have good enough coverage that it should be a usable tool for everybody to use. Wow, that's amazing. So, um, like I said, we were talking about some of those things that map, right? Like the like the mapping system, for example. You know, the yep. Um, Xamarin Forms has this basic solution where you just say, you know, bring bring up this location and whatever the mapping app is on the platform, and it just pulls it up. But I'm thinking of other um, uh, of other things that are that are Windows specific. You know, what what are some of the? Uh, is there anything that isn't exposed in other words is there anything that in uwp that you weren't able to translate to ios android WebAssembly? so there's a lot of things that that can't be translated into uh, into ios and android or 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 web assembly for that matter depending on what apis are provided uh, but basically what, what we're trying to do is is um, provide a lot of abstractions uh, for the developers that want to do general development so let's say for instance uh, you want to use the api for life tiles well, tough luck. I mean, it's not available on, on iOS and Android, so it's not going to map to anything. Uh, but if you want to use, let's say, uh, geolocation, for instance, uh, then at this in this case, yes, it's it's uh, it's mostly available. I mean, there may be some corner cases where it's not working exactly as the platform is going to be providing it. Yeah. So, and there's a way to escape the box and, and get access to the underlying platform. Uh, but you know, if you want to stick with what uh, UWP provided, that the the let's say somehow you know, basic or the middle middle scenario is, is okay for you, then then go for it and use the UWP implementation if it's it's if it's available. Okay. But if you look at it and take a step back, the, the true value of Uno and why we built it was to solve primarily UI challenges, right? Of being able to define a user interface once if you want to do it and have it being uh, pixel perfect across the platforms. Right. After that, for that extra two or five percent of the remaining code base that you have to target multi-platforms should it be for a bluetooth uh, communications or gps access or camera access if uno doesn't provide it you can still create your own abstractions or tap uh, into xamarin.mobile or other frameworks that already abstract some of those services across platforms or even code it on a per platform basis right so the biggest challenges that we've seen and struggled with was to be able to get the same layout, the same rendering logic across platforms and right. get, the, get that pixel perfection. And that's where, like, if you look at the Windows UI set of APIs and contracts, that's where we've spent most of the time, right? With the binding engines, right. with styling, templating, and all that goodness. So down below is the Xamarin Mono stuff. Is it Xamarin or is it Mono or is it both? It's both, uh, but only on, on iOS and Android. On uh, WebAssembly, it's only Mono. Sure. Sure. And on Windows, none of the above. It's just running .NET. And the other thing that really impressed me when you guys talked to us was that you've been using this code base to write your own apps for customers that are actually in the store and running uh, on sites for four years. Is that right? Yes, since we started building uh, Uno. Obviously, in the beginning, we had a lot more friction. Uh, but now we can uh, write end-to-end -end solutions uh, with mobile apps for our larger customers across platforms with the Uno code base that we're publishing now to the community, right? So yeah, it's been a, it's been a struggle, but we're now there. That's amazing. Um, so I mean, and I didn't even have to see a demo of it. Uh, just the fact that you guys have been using it just is mind blowing. And and you said yes, it is free, and you're working on open sourcing it, right, on GitHub. Yes, so there's already a new Git package available for people to play with, but we're planning to push out uh, uh, the sources within the next few days, if all goes well, for everybody to uh, enjoy. So the light bulb that went off for me, guys, is this solves Microsoft's XAML problem. 
And if it weren't for the fact that they own Xamarin, they're investing so much money in Xamarin, this would have been a much, much more elegant solution for them back when they had, when the problem was actually acute. You know what I mean? Yes. Now it's just sort of like pick your own framework and uh, it's going to be work no matter what. Oh, you mean I can just take my UWP app and run it on iOS and Android? That's what we wanted all along, isn't it? So, and just to clarify that point, like we're playing nicely with Xamarin, right? even with Xamarin forms in a sense. So we're sitting on top of Xamarin. Yes, we are similar in terms of uh, what's expected in terms of behavior and why we're building something in terms of UI across platforms similar to Xamarin forms. Uh, we have uh, a different set of limitations or features that we've built on top of. But when I'm saying we're playing nicely with Xamarin Forms, Uno is rendering native uh, UIs on iOS and Android, right? Even right. WebAssembly. But let's keep WebAssembly apart for a second. Yeah. We're building uh, iOS and Android native apps using Xamarin. That means that not right. only could you integrate, and because we're a UWP-based platform, it means you can integrate any other UWP uh, third party, right? It means you can integrate your Windows Toolkit and have Windows Toolkit run on iOS and Android now. Yeah. It means that uh, Laurent Bignon's uh, MBVM Lite runs on iOS and Android now without his specific targets, just with the UWP code base. Do you see that most customers are actually going to be starting with the UWP apps and looking to do cross-platform with them? Well, yes, and the prom- and why we believe so is we've lived through it, right? And the promise right. where the, the dev loop and the developer experience on Windows using Visual Studio is far superior to anything else out there that we've enjoyed uh, mm-hmm. It's way faster, and just look at XAML, it didn't continue, right? You could spend your whole uh, seven hours in a day uh, running and debugging the, your source code without uh, ever stopping it, right? That's how powerful the tool is today. I have a very s- selfish question to ask. I don't know if anybody else really cares, but uh, did you um, encapsulate the audio system, the, the audio recording and playback system, the hardware? Not yet. Not yet, but it's been it's been a, a few people have been asking for the the video part of it, so we're probably going to be taking a look at it. But yeah, it's been it's been requested a few times. But I'm pretty sure we'll accept your pull request. Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> once once we're there, right? Yeah, this is the thing. exactly. <laughs> right. But and going back to the Xamarin story, the the other aspect of it uh, when talking about Xamarin forms is as I was saying before, we're uh, because we're building. Uh, iOS and Android native experiences, it then means that you could have in a hybrid mode where you're both using, for whatever reason, existing Xamarin Forms assets along with your uh, Uno-based UWP app, right? So you can mix and match any of your existing UWP third parties, but any other uh, native third parties that would be platform-specific. If you have an amazing viewer in iOS, uh, a third-party component that's open-sourced, that you want to bring into your uh, Uno app just for iOS and have a different native component from Android, you can definitely do that, right? We allow for platform-specific code all, along with the UWP code base. Awesome. And uh, guys, give us one moment here for this very important message. Support for .NET Rocks is brought to you by Conversational UI from Progress Telerik and Kendo UI. Conversational UI are chatbot framework agnostic user interface controls and components that enable .NET and JavaScript developers to create modern conversational chatbot experiences in their web, mobile, and desktop applications. The industry's first package set of user interface components built specifically for chatbots are available as part of Telerik's ASP.NET AJAX, ASP.NET MVC, ASP.NET Core, WinForms, WPF, Xamarin Products, and Kendo UI for jQuery, Angular, Vue, React, PHP, and JSP libraries. By implementing key UI design features such as calendars, date pickers, list views, and others that are included in the tool sets, developers will be able to improve chatbot conversation through visual elements. For more information, visit Telerik.com slash conversational dash UI. And we're back. It's .NET Rocks. Carl and Richard talking to Jerome and Francoise. We're talking about Uno and just this idea of Starting from UWP, because if, if you were doing this four years ago, that's like right at the beginning of UWP. It's gone through huge convulsions in yeah. those times. Sure exactly. Has. And, and what, what's interesting at, it, at this point uh, of time is that uh, when we were looking at uh, trying to create something that was that would allow us to, to reuse UI, 
uh, we there was only Xamarin at this point. We were just uh, what right. we call Xamarin Classic, which is just uh, plain uh, iOS and Android UI kits uh, or uh, UI development uh, UI APIs that were available at that time. And um, there was Civilite, and there was just uh, what the, what was called uh, you know there was, was the Windows Phone April one at that time. So it was ju- just just right before UWP, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, it still made sense at that time because you know Civilite and WPF were very similar, and uh, and there, there's there's a huge base of the, uh, Civilite developers that are, that are out there, and they, they still have yeah. they still have those apps that are running at and they're still angry, and they're, they're definitely still angry, well. and, and we get that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was at that time. So we we tried we chose between you know, uh, developing something that was completely uh, uh, either native or you know, reused what was native, and it was not a very good experience for us because it, mm-hmm. it required different teams that would know the, the frameworks very deeply, uh, or just do something that that we have the we had the, the experience for, which is uh, XAML uh, close to Civilite, and uh, then after afterwards uh, UWP. Right. So. I know that you guys have talked to people at Microsoft. I know this because I've talked to them about you, but I'm but I'm kind of getting the cold shoulder. Is that a complicated relationship? It is right. Uh, we're we're thinking that we're building on top uh, of what uh, the Windows platform and the Visual Studio team has to offer uh, by leveraging Xamarin. It's a different angle that we're playing with. Uh, we're getting a tremendous traction uh, from the community already. Some people were expecting something like this for a while now. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say that uh, we're getting a, a warmer reception now that we're open sourcing everything for obvious reasons. Sure. And uh, But uh, we have tremendous feedback even from uh, some uh, folks at Microsoft, right? So uh, hopefully we're, it's only been a, a week. Uh, or so since uh, we've uh, announced everything and that we were we provide this to the community. So hopefully, uh, uh, as you publish this or as we speak of, of this again over a beer in a few weeks, uh, mm-hmm. we'll be in a different place. Sure. Yeah. I, I'm sure once it all comes out, there's going to yes. be some interesting actors that appear. Like the world's going to get more complex. But, you know, I think what you're hinting at, Carl, is just this recognition that there's been – Two distinct dis- flavors of XAML, really more than that. Sure. In the WPF XAML, it was part of the .NET team. Right. And the UWP XAML, it was part of the Windows team. Right. And they were actually separate teams, although as of this latest reorg, they're now one team. As you talk to Billy Hollis, who's just a UWP master, right? The UWP XAML is faster, you know, more performant, better than the WPF XAML stack is what he says, right? But still not a lot of people are using it. And as I Mm -hmm. said before in Tuesday's show, uh, I think that's just because it's Windows only, right? And I think that, you know, more people are trying the cross-platform approach, whether that's Xamarin Forms or whether that's some version of uh, the hybrid model, the web model, or something like that, Ionic or... That kind of thing. But uh, but this really is... And Richard, you've been talking about this for how long? When are we going to mm. see a unified XAML, right? Well, that was supposed to be XAML standard. Yeah, well, we thought it was going to be XAML standard, but then that's sort of just like, yeah, maybe. But this sort of solves the problem, doesn't it? It, it does. And when you're looking at XAML standard and why, like uh, you were mentioning, uh, the cold shoulder, right? You're looking at XAML standard as some intersection between... The UWP XAML and whatever Xamarin Forms has in terms of XAML to come up with some unified contract, right? Mm-hmm. But if you're looking at a UWP first experience, UWP is your XAML contract. Whatever right. UWP offers, it is your contract. So you don't need a separate contract that would be a subset of UWP as long as you have a close to 100% coverage on what uh, the Windows UI namespace offers. Then you're in good shape. Obviously, you could go then go into the non UI aspects as you've mentioned in Bluetooth right. and GPS and camera and file storage. And the other aspects. But if you're able to get your app to the point where you get pixel perfection across platforms, you're in good shape. And that pixel perfectness is, is the, the key driver for us because we have a team of designers uh, in, in, at, at and and they, they, they want the, the nitty gritty details about you know that their super rounded button that needs to have the perfect shade and sure. and animation right. and trace states and disable state and 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 for most for for various reasons if you use native controls you can't get that so sure you're you're close to the platform if you do that but if you want to have the same look and feel on all platforms at once you 
you, you, it's pretty difficult to do uh, with the other uh, with the other platforms that exist, and especially with Xamarin with renderers and and uh, yeah. And so I was just going to bring that up. So Xamarin forms when they first came out, and there were things that you couldn't do that uh, you know were specific to the platform. You had to do a custom renderer, and then they came out with this great i uh, way to just declare the native objects in the XAML itself you know and just have three versions or however many versions of the platforms that you're supporting right so you'd basically have um you know a declaration for an android control a declaration for an ios control and a declaration for a uwp control and they would be in the same group and then each one would render on their specific platform and the others would be ignored do you guys have anything similar to that so yes, yes we do. But the thing is that uh, we we've taken the approach in, in a more let's say a UWP ish way. Uh, the the way the U, the way UWP works is that you have eye level controls, like say let's say for a button, for example, for example. And then inside of that button, when you template it, there's a notion of of a presenter. Right. And uh, if you use the the let's say the native presenter, you can have a button that that renders or uses the native button. So the same way you've, you've described uh, using the native iOS UI button or a button from Android or HTML button or input button for, for uh, HTML. But there's the other way around, which is just drawing the button completely. So both ways are supported. Like when we say drawing, we mean uh, having a border, lines, uh, rectangles, and uh, and uh, anything that you have to to display your button in a more uh, the highest fidelity uh, mm. of this button. So conceptually, if you look at it, conceptually, it's still a button from UWP standpoint, but using control templating, look at it as styling, right? Either you use a native style or you use the unified pixel perfect style. You get to choose. That's great. It's wow. really cool. So we also like to ask our guests, and let's start with you, Francois. If you had $5,000 to spend on technology today, what would you buy? Uh, everything I can find from a home automation standpoint for the country house, right? So that my pool's warm when I get there during a weekend and I have a simple app to, that manages AC, uh, exterior lighting and everything else. Hey Siri, drain the pool. <laughs> <laughs> or Cortana, right? Whatever works for you. Yeah. Okay. Good enough. What about you, Jerome? We didn't we didn't think on this, but it's it's the same for me. I mean, I've been oh, you guys are both things. doing home, home automation. automation. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, much really funny. It's just home everything automation. that I can find. Like uh, I just find out about uh, uh, custom vents that are uh, just uh, opening and closing ma uh, automatically, want to to adjust uh, and have something that uh, has a unified uh, temperature across the whole house. So that's the kind of thing that I that I would want to push. You guys are into unifying, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We, we Uno are. house. <laughs> yeah. It's very, very cool. And I can go on a diatribe about HVAC solutions for hours. In fact, I should probably do a geek out just on HVAC. I just don't know that anybody would listen to it. And, I hmm. probably would. <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of those. It's a harder problem than you think. I we've I'm actually at my coast place right now, and it's a beautiful sunny day. And one of the challenges is managing heat. There's a lot of sunlight pouring in. You don't just want to air condition it. You know, I want a little pop-up automated vent in the top of the of the ceiling, basically that blows that hot air off and draws the cool air from the ocean in. And uh, you know, that's not that simple to do. There's lots of little bits and pieces to get that right, and then to make it reliable enough that that folks that aren't into gadgets actually want to use it. It's programming all this. That's that's uh, afterwards a lot of fun. Yeah. Absolutely. And and coming up with the if this then that sort of scenarios for when it should be open, when it should be closed. So on. Anyway, yeah, very fact, good. you know, I'm not even going to talk about the cost there because if you got five grand to spend on home automation, you can spend it. You can do stuff for a couple hundred dollars. You can do stuff for $20,000, but five grand will get you going on some things. There's no two ways about it. Let's talk about the component model. So one of the things I love about Xamarin Forms is that there's this whole environment, um, you know, there's this whole GitHub repository of components that... James and Montemagno and other people have written for Xamarin Forms, they can just sort of plug in and 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 they do these uh, low-level platform-specific hardware things, but with the same uh, code. And um, so w have you guys written any of these things? Uh, do you anticipate a sort of community growing up around that? Do you have one already? Yeah, so the great thing, as I was mentioning before, is we can actually leverage 
all community contributions from a UWP standpoint. Uh, so uh, I was mentioning MBVM Lite, I was mentioning Windows Toolkit, uh, mm-hmm. Teneric UWP for that matters, and all the other uh, component providers that oh, have yeah. a UWP solution can be retargeted to Uno so that they can work across platforms, right? Wow. So you but you need the source code, it. right? Yeah. And and if you look at it uh, from a different angle, uh, I won't, uh, we'll probably come up with announcements in, in a few days, but uh, you, because we're a UWP stack, uh, you could in theory uh, envision a world where uh, Xamarin forms uh, targeting UWP as a renderer mm. uh, could sit on top of Uno that sits on top of WebAssembly, right? So you could have Xamarin forms, and I may have seen it, uh, uh, seeing uh, Xamarin forms running in, a, in the browser using WebAssembly, right? So that's how extensive wow. is our UWP coverage. So pretty similar to the efforts uh, that Frank did with the uh, OUI, right? Or okay. OUI, so it. you mentioned Telerik UI for Universal Windows Platform. This is a uh, adaptive UI for building Windows 10 apps with one code base, completely open source. So that means you get the source code to these tools. Yes, they did open source it. That's amazing. So you got like grid charts, data form, list view, all that stuff, calendars, uh, editors, navigation, visualization, geo visualization, and yeah. uh, and that can all go right from. Um, that code for UWP to iOS, Android, and and WebAssembly, and be completely responsive, right? True. Uh, during the build, as an example, right, they announced the data grid on UWP, and and during that first night uh, between cocktails, Jerome within the hour had it running on Uno, right? So we did uh, we, on Uno on WebAssembly. So the next morning, we were showing a screenshot of data grid running on WebAssembly. Holy crap! So we don't have to get make new controls because we've already got them. We've got them. That's amazing. So, so on the other part of your question, which is uh, the support of, of components that have been built for, for Xamarin, there's two ways to look at it. There's The first one is those components do work already unless they're, they're, you're relying specifically on Xamarin forms. But most of right. those, yeah, they, 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 um, they released uh, what's called Xamarin Essentials. So those components don't rely on Xamarin forms. So oh, yeah, sure. Fixable. They're usable as is. I mean, it's that's it's right because they're just C sharp code. They're not UI code. They're they're exactly. that's for the platform access. Exactly. So there's no there's no specifics for this. So that that works. Wow. All right, mind being blown even more now. <laughs> and there's another side as well, which is just taking the UWP API and just providing you know providing implementations from the outside. So there we're investigating investigating those uh, parts. Which is basically we have uh, all the UWP API that some parts have, re- have been implemented, some have not been implemented, and for those that have not, uh, we're we're investigating and see if we could just allow people to just plug in their their own implementation of parts of the U- UWP API in a pluginized way. Are there um, Bootstrap like libraries for styling and themes for UWP that you can take advantage of that would go all the way to these other platforms? Uh, it's UWP. So th- in terms of styling, you can take whatever has been available already. Uh, for, right. For yeah, UW- I, I know that. I just don't know what's available. I didn't know if you guys knew. We 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 tend, we, we tend to use what our designers are providing. So yeah, right. not really, but you know, there there's been uh, the CSS implementations that have been uh, they were tried out uh, around with uh, with UWP. So there's that uh, that, mm. that can be used as well. Uh, as long as it's targeting UWP and, and that we've implemented what they're using, uh, I mean, it, it should work as well. So at Build, and we, you know, we're recording this after Build, although it's publishing somewhat later than that, there was this enorm- announcement around Core 3 and bringing WPF and WinForms to Core Windows-only implementations. And this has naturally led to a conversation about, since you're going to associate with Core, is, there, is it going to be open source and cross-platform? And I'm wondering if it's already done. Huh. Uh, I mean, uh, having UWP, uh, WPF on WinForms on running on other yeah. platforms, is that what you mean? Yeah. Uh, you, you know, I don't know if they've, they've been doing it, but for us, I mean, it's not something that we're targeting anyway. So maybe Microsoft has been doing it on their end, uh, but it's quite an undertaking. And there's a lot of things that they rely on, uh, like GDI or DirectX or things like that to be able to run properly. So that may be one of the reasons it's not available on other platforms. 
Well, and then, of course, they haven't, Microsoft has not open sourced their implementation of WPF, but I'm thinking here is an open source implementation that already runs on iOS and Android. So running it on Linux is trivial. You're already there, essentially. You know, what is Android under the hood, really? So, uh, yeah, it, it really depends. So say that we, we've been having a few questions about supporting other platforms. So uh, right. we, we're basically targeting specifically the APIs of iOS and Android. So let's say when you're rendering a panel or something like that or a text block, mm -hmm. a text box to, to, to input text, we're, we're using the primitives of the platform so that we, we don't lose accessibility, which is a, big, a, a very important point for us. Right. The color system works properly. The scaling system works properly. Like all this stuff that's built into the phone for accessibility, because you're not cheating, you're going through that subsystem, you get it automatically. Yes, that's an important distinction that Jerome's making. We're not drawing everything uh, like Flutter would be doing, right? We're actually mm, tapping right. into the native controls by styling them, by uh, laying them out as needed using our containers like grids and stack panels and all that. Right? It's a huge distinction. Yeah, and I think wildly important, but at the same time, it makes me question your pixel-perfect goal. Because in the end, you are still allowing that device to do some rendering there, to make some decisions about how things look. The platform is managing the behaviors. We're actually right. telling it how to draw and where to draw. Okay. That's cool. Hmm. Yeah, I don't, I'm not about, I'm not a count the pixels guy. I just, it's going to be a challenge to be that accurate. So I just found the, um, the latest audio recorder plugin for uh, Xamarin. And it looks like uh, it looks like it works. So there's a, it's an audio recorder plugin for Xamarin and Windows. It works on uh, Android, UWP, and iOS, and it records audio on a device's microphone input. So there you go. You can, you can probably add the WebAssembly support as well because there's microphone APIs as well. Right, wild. Uh, it doesn't work on uh, streams though. It's sort of just like a start recording you know, stop recording, get access to the file with an event. So it's not like, a, it doesn't look like there's a stream. Oh, wait a minute. No, it's also possible to get a stream to the recording audio data as it's being recorded. So, okay, I I sit corrected. It looks like it works. Uh, it's l only recording in wave audio format so far. And signal detection is not currently working as well on UWP. So that's, but it's there. Very interesting. I don't know if anybody else cares but me. But uh, there you go. What are some of the other challenges that you guys uh, faced when developing this stuff? So there, there's quite a few. Um, you know, compatibility explicitly for, for UWP, let's say, to have a control that behaves exactly the same uh, across all those platforms is, is quite challenging. You, you make one modification and it happens to ripple around uh, all those platforms. So there's quite a bit of, of QAing to do. Uh, right. And performance is another one. Uh, performance has been one big driver to have something that that um, you know, responds correctly, doesn't lag, or you know, when you try to scroll, uh, you scroll a list with a very rich content that those UI designers want to put everything inside. It has to not lag. So that's why we've implementing things like um, you know, uh, render phases in, inside of uh, list view items. You know, so that's something that that no one wants uh, to implement because it's pretty complex to do, but still it's, it's one thing that if you have a you know, very large item templates with lots of icons and numbers and, and images, then you want to have a phasing integrated into it. Yeah, sure. What are the common things that somebody coming with a UWP app are going to run into trying to start implementing the cross platform options here? Are there usual mistakes? Yes. So when they haven't separated their apps into layers where Right. Uh, they thought ahead of time as to how it would behave when they're tapping into platform-specific services. So let's say they're looking at the uh, contact address board or whatever other Windows-specific API they're using. If it's a uh, or highly coupled in their code base and it's not separated from the UI logic, for example, if it's code behind or stuff like that, it'll be uh, it, it will require ultimately some refactoring and uh, integrating some MVVM-like pattern or something like that and uh, abstracting away some of those services prior to having the UWP code base uh, working on all platforms. Right. right. Yeah. So it, do it does matter how you architect in the first place as, as to how much struggle you're going to have here. But are, are there pieces that you haven't implemented yet or haven't been implemented yet you think people are going to run into? So on uh, on iOS and Android, our coverage is way higher because we've done so many apps on it. So we, we did right. augment coverage to reach 
of those edge cases. Obviously, on a WebAssembly, it is a technology preview. So people were asking us about the tree view control. That's not something we haven't committed to just yet. So you can sure. actually see the list of the, all the controls that we do support today through the playground uh, live player that you, you can play with. Uh, but we're augmenting that coverage as we go. So that will yeah. be more challenging, right? And that's why it's just a, an experimental preview. It's far from production ready. And you can always contribute it itself. But, you know, that actually begs a question. Why are you open sourcing this project, guys? You've been working on it for years. It's clearly worth, it represents hours and hours of labor. It's helped you build software for a long time. Why open source? It's a valid question, right? And we had to add, uh, have many beers before we decided to go away with it. Honestly, because <laughs> we believe that we can get uh, community contribution for people to uh, to fill in the gaps and we'll go faster and other people will enjoy it. And because we're the creators of it, we don't necessarily believe that we'll lose the edge of being able to use it as we move forward. So we truly right. believe in the open source model now. And uh, and uh, But in full transparency, at some point, we do believe some people will ask for more extended support and would be able to offer it. Right. So, you, I mean, I because I, I think it's important. It's certainly important to me as a consumer of this library. And, you know, maybe I can make some contributions, but I want to know that those principal contributors, they can stay alive. And then nothing scarier than taking a dependency on an open source library as, as significant as this. And then you've got to go off and do something else. Like that's challenging for everyone. So, you, but your business is about making apps. You happen to use this framework. You're happy to let other people use the framework as well. But you, this is you, that's where your living is, not building frameworks. True. We have 75 mobile engineers in Montreal using this tool every, day in, day out. Right. And so bringing in more people, just broadening that horizon, that's, that's just making it better. Hmm. Exactly. Wow. It does seem to be a new business model, isn't it? That we're happier when our frameworks are open source and shared, and then it's what we build with them that becomes our competitive edge. And you guys have been cranking them out too right i mean like i said it's been four years but uh how many apps have you built with this thing over 200 what wow. what <laughs> yeah it's our business right that's all we've been doing in the past obviously we've diversified in web and azure and other cloud offerings but the core of our business today remains building large-scale mobile apps both enterprise and consumer grade yes amazing but primarily for customers, you're paid to build those apps. You're not, yes, you're not Atlee Hunter coming, coming up with weird new apps and trying to find revenue streams for them. Totally true. Yeah. I, you know, there's the other aspect of the business model of open source is that you are going to meet customers who like this framework that are looking for tech support for it, that are want to sign a service contract for it long term, uh, not for the code base itself, but for access to skilled people. And I guess that that's a potential business for anybody who gets talented with this framework. Yes, and we are, are already seeing agencies that are uh, interested in looking and providing feedback as to what we build, what we know, and are willing and open to give it a try. Right? So uh, we're welcoming them. Right. And I guess you know, part of this message is not we're abandoning this framework on, uh, into open source because we don't want to work on it anymore, but you actually want to make it bigger and the bringing a community with you helps. And we want to sell eventually enterprise support, right? So it'll be core yeah. to our business for sure. Sure. No, I think all those oh things are possible. Wow. Uh, so. Dude, yeah. Carl doesn't want to talk anymore. Carl wants to write code. I, I just, know that voice I just very want to well. stop talking and download this stuff and play. <laughs> I actually did um, do it, but my, my laptop, uh, for some reason, is not able to run any kind of Xamarin stuff, uh, the Android side anyway. So I, got, I had a roadblock there. You get into a funky state sometimes. Yeah. Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> but once I figure that stuff out, um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, for sure. And we'll be there to help. That's awesome. I'm looking at the Uno playground, and it reminds me of Wii. Look at <laughs> XAML running in the browser. Yeah. Although I saw a note here that says runs better in Edge. I thought, that's interesting. Opened up Edge, and yep, runs better in Edge. Yeah, isn't that funny? The edge developers at the at Build were interested to see that they were the fastest running browser for that kind of uh, for WebAssembly. <laughs> web right. Assembly, yes. When it doesn't sound like you guys have done a lot of optimization for WebAssembly, it's all experimental right now. But yeah, that, that that's the thing about about uh, Mono. So, it's, so th that story behind this is we looked at it in January of this year, and there was pretty much nothing. There was you know, 
usable in a, in any kind of production way or you know, say right. close to production. And then I look, I turn my head around and, and just look again, uh, let's say beginning of, uh, of April, and then there's something that works completely. And uh, it was completely unexpected. We started being, building on it and pushing things like reactive extensions, Roslyn or things like that. And they, they mostly all worked perfectly, uh, slow, wow. perfectly. So we pushed the boundaries, and so you know what what could we do with Uno? And uh, the more we pushed, the more it worked. So <laughs> we we ended up with the playground with with all this. So that's why we rushed an experimental preview a week before a build uh, building something and announcing it uh, on that Monday morning. That's really exciting. That is amazing. And it does speak to we're going to start evaluating browsers abilities to perform wasm operations in the in the near future if this path continues i mean it still feels experimental i don't see anyone doubling down on wasm yet we're j it's all experiments and you guys i mm -hmm. think are no exception this is an experiment and if you have a chance to go look at the google io uh, presentation where they showcase uh, autodesk's autocad running in, on WebAssembly, it's pretty amazing now that's a big web assembly. Holy <laughs> man. It's like it is. the only thing that even would, you know, punch it the same way would be something like Office. Look, I got Outlook running in a browser. Oh great. But uh it's not but far. to have it's auto to have AutoCAD, one of the ultimate legacy apps. Right. I mean AutoCAD actually owns lines in Windows, like if AutoCAD this behavior. That's the it's a great example. Yep. That's the thing about WebAssembly, though. Most people think about it about a, a, you know, coming from a JavaScript background, just about doing right. computational stuff uh, just in the browser. Uh, but that's not it. I mean, and the, re the only reason we we're keeping the experimental tag on the playground is because Mono is experimental in a way of performance. But in terms of, of behavior, it's it's pretty close to the the uh, the release mode of of uh, Xamarin on iOS and Android. So. The Absolutely. behavior is perfect, or most perfect, but it's just performance that's not there yet. But it's that's pretty much it. These are fixable problems. So it's uh, it's uh, the interpreter mode of uh, of Mono that's uh, that's been developed. Uh, they're they're pushing the AO ahead of time compilation uh, back into their branch. I don't I think during the uh, this month and next month. And once they do that, then the the performance is going to be pretty close to to metal. Uh, I, I, I'd like to think that it's going to be 470 times faster than it is right now, just because that someone, <laughs> oh, and I'm not, I'm not just inventing that number. It's because someone made a, uh, uh, a benchmark about, uh, a C algorithm that was running in one millisecond using C compiled to Wasm and the same algorithm right. running in mono, uh, interpreted mode was running in uh, 470 times, uh, at 470 milliseconds. So I'm, I'd like to right. think that it's going to go that low in terms of yeah. performance improvement. Well, they, we they, that's a reasonable supposition. It'll be interesting to see if it comes true. <laughs> Guys, this is amazing. It's amazing. And uh, I hope everybody listening understands the how awesome this actually is and what it means. It's mind-blowing. It's life-changing. It's all of those things. Thank you for doing it, and thanks for opening it up for all of us to use. You're welcome. Now you have to play with it. Absolutely. That's why they call me Play With It Carl. Yeah, my, I quote my friend Carl Franklin when we finish our joint talk on development platform. Now go write some code. Now go write some code. <laughs> 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 All right, talk to you guys later. Thanks a lot. Thanks, thank you. And we'll see you next time on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Pwop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and of course in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a